A quadruple murder rocks a small Kentucky town to its core. I'm playing my brother has been shot. It's probably the worst crime scene I've seen in almost 20 years of doing this. As a mystery unravels. What would possess someone to kill a mother, a father, and a daughter? What could have happened? And why did it happen? A homegrown horror is unmasked. The way her body was found was particularly disturbing. I'll we'll never forget that, ever. Leaving grieving relatives to seek justice. Before that, I was not a person that carried a, a weapon. Needless to say, things changed. There's evil in this world. I'm Troy Roberts. I've come to Western Kentucky to find out how a beloved and God-fearing family was killed and to learn what would drive someone to commit such a brutal and senseless murder. When you drive into Katy's, Kentucky, what you notice are the rolling farms, the tobacco barns, and the mom and pop shops. It's a bit like driving into America's past. Katy's is just a really neat little town. It has beautiful streets. It has old historic homes. The people are very proud of their contributions to the history of Western Kentucky. The Champion family has lived in this part of Western Kentucky for generations. Hi, I'm Troy Roberts. I'm Lisa Champion. Thanks for having me. It's beautiful here. Well, it looks better when it's not as wet. <laughs> We've had an extremely wet February. Every time Lisa Champion steps out onto her front porch, she is forced to relive the worst day of her life. I know. Your loved ones are in your heart every day. But when you walk outside your home and you see this reminder across the street where your loved ones were brutally murdered, how do you get past that? It's very difficult. Um, I, I harbor a lot of anger, much <laughs> anger. Um, but there's some days where I'll just, I'll just break down crying, just wailing. Lisa's brother, Lindsay Champion, was just a young boy when his parents moved to the family farm in the late 1950s. Lindsay and I, we, we had a bond because we did so much together. What kind of man was Lindsay? He was fun, he was funny. He's a very dry sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Lindsay met his wife, Joy, in high school. They married soon after graduation in July, 1972. Tell me about her sister. She was just joy, just like her name. She taught school. She loved her students. And she was a wonderful teacher. While Joy was in the classroom, Lindsay worked as the director of a farmer's credit union and was an elder at the family's church. He was devoted to Joy and his family. I never heard him say a bad word about anybody. Good God-fearing people. But despite the couple's happy marriage, there was something missing in Joy's life. So she had several miscarriages. Yes. She lost a couple of babies, and uh, it was hard. They wanted a child. So after years of trying and failing to have a baby on their own, Joy and Lindsay decided to adopt. Tell me about the arrival of Ryan. He was born in September of 1978, and they adopted him around December or January. They must have been elated. Yes, yes. Yeah. It was just like it, he was their own child. Lindsay and Joy doted on their son. Then, when Ryan was five years old, a miracle happened. Joy was able to conceive and able to carry up until full, full term. And Emily was born April 29th, 1983. Joy and Lindsay loved their two children 
and treated them equally. But like many siblings, Emily and Ryan didn't always get along perfectly. We did begin to notice that whenever Emily would get attention, then he would do whatever he had to do to get the attention away from her. That's a sibling rivalry, perhaps, that kind Perhaps of... so, yes. As the years went by, Emily and Ryan took very different paths. You know, Emily knew from an early, early age what she wanted to do, and she set her sail, and, and she accomplished what she wanted to do. But Ryan didn't seem to possess his sister's ambition. He was bright, as bright as Emily. He just didn't apply himself. Where Emily set goals and worked and studied, he didn't want to do that. In search of a purpose, Ryan joined the Army in his mid-20s. You know, his parents supported him, and they had good expectations for him, you know, and they thought the military would be a good fit for him. After almost eight years in the military, Ryan was discharged. Now in his 30s, he moved back to western Kentucky to the nearby city of Oak Grove. Meanwhile, after graduating from Auburn University, Emily, now 31 years old, had moved further south to Louisiana to work as a horse veterinarian at a racetrack. And Joy and Lindsay, now retired in their 60s, were enjoying their golden years. In late October 2014, Emily Champion came home to spend time with her parents. Saturday, October 25th, was a busy day for the family. Emily ran in a local marathon, and later, Joy and Lindsay attended their friend Debbie's birthday party. We had a great time. Mm -hmm. And when they got ready to leave, hugged them, and that was the last time we saw them. That was the last time. The next morning started off just like any other Sunday. Lindsay and Joy attended services at Katie's Church of Christ. Emily stayed home to recuperate from her marathon. It was a beautiful day. I mean, it was blue sky, fall, not a cloud in the sky. And I even said that day from the pulpit, this is going to be a great day. After church let out, the champions returned home. Just after 11 a.m., Lindsay Champion's sister Lisa heard loud gunshots coming from her brother's house across the street. I just thought it was very unusual that time of day. And uh, I got up and went down to the bedroom, and I heard something at my door. And it was, Lisa, Lisa. So I come down to the hallway, and there he is at my front door. Your nephew. Right. And he's got the pistol in his hand. His wrists were taped with just a small amount of duct tape around his wrist. And he's saying, call 911. Hey, ma'am, what's your emergency? Uh, my nephew, Ryan Champion, just came to my door, and his wrists have been tied with duct tape, and I haven't been able to find out what, what's wrong. He doesn't appear to be injured, but I don't know what's happened. While still on the line with the dispatcher, Lisa was able to get a bit more information from Ryan. And he said, this guy that liked Emily busted into the house. And I said, do we need an ambulance? And he said, yeah, we need an ambulance. OK, ma'am, where would I be sending the ambulance to? Right across the road. I'm going to go over there with him, OK? OK, ma'am. So um, I cut the tape off of his wrist. And I say, well, we're going over there. And so we drive over to the house. And I just say, well, where is everybody? And he just says, they're in there. And I said, what do you mean they're in there? And he said, you don't want to go in there. So at that point, I get out of the truck. I go to the door, and there's a bullet hole. And um, open the door. 911, where's your emergency? Oh, please, my brother has been shot. And his wife, Joy, my nephew, and his here, and my niece has been shot. Up. He's been evil. Evil? Yes. What would you call somebody that murdered your family? 
We told her she was under arrest, and she said she wasn't. She wasn't. Lisa Champion had just discovered the bodies of her brother, sister-in-law, and niece gunned down in their home. Only her nephew, Ryan, had managed to escape. Emergency responders are arriving now. And so from there, they pretty much took over. Former Trigg County Sheriff Ray Burnham was one of the first responders on the scene. So were you familiar with the name Champion when you uh, got here? Yes, sir, I was. She was uh, my elementary school teacher. Really, Joy was? Mm-hmm. That's been horrific for you. It did a it was Champion. I, I said I wouldn't do this. <laughs> Miss Champion, every, she was beloved by everybody. She was a great teacher. Everybody thought a lot of her. Mr. Champion, I knew him. I did not know him as well. And Emily, I knew her, but did not know her as well. Still to this day, it's raw. It's the first time back since, the, that, since that day. In need of additional assistance, the sheriff's office called in the Kentucky State Police to help with the investigation. It was probably the worst crime scene I've seen in almost 20 years of doing this. It was an indoor-outdoor scene. And uh, outside was the father. He had obvious gunshot wounds to his head. He was out on a concrete landing off the uh, side of the house. And once you went inside, what did you see? Saw a, a girl around the other side of the wall that was duct taped up over her face. From her nose to the bottom of her chin, duct tape, probably seven or eight times around hands duct taped together real thick uh, feet duct taped together as well and two bullet holes in her head that was emily that was emily yes sir and then joy where she was shot uh, was the front of her face and she was laying slumped over face down in addition to the three members of the champion family police also discovered a fourth body inside the house an unidentified male I was thinking, who would do this? Who would come in there and do this to this family? And who was the guy laying on the floor? In search of answers, Sergeant Miller went back outside to speak with the tragedy's sole survivor. Ryan said he had been at his parents' home with his sister when suddenly they heard someone enter the house. Ryan said that he and Emily were in the, in the living room and he heard somebody come in and they both thought that it was their parents home early from church. But it wasn't Lindsay and Joy. It was a man Ryan recognized. His name was Vito Reservado. Vito came all the way and he had a handgun and a rolled duct tape, one in each hand. Ryan didn't seem to know much about Vito, only that they had met just days earlier and Vito had quickly become obsessed with his sister Emily. According to Ryan, Vito put the gun on Ryan and said, if you do something stupid, I'm going to hurt your sister. And uh, he said that Vito taped him up and told him, don't move, don't do anything stupid. I'm not going to hurt anybody. And then uh, taped up Emily. The parents arrive at the house. And what happens next? Vito took off running. He went out the side door. A moment later, Ryan said he heard gunshots outside. And what happened next? Vito came running back and ran past Ryan, and he said he immediately put the gun on Emily and shot twice. Still bound to the chair, Emily Champion was executed with two gunshots to her head. Ryan said that's when Vito turned the gun on him. And that's when Ryan made his move and fight the gun away from him and shoot him one time in the head. And uh, he said it was over with at that point. What Ryan couldn't explain was Vito's motive. What reason could Vito have had to kill the Champion family? As Ryan recounted his ordeal, 
Word of the murders began to spread around the small, close-knit town. Friends and family were already rushing to the scene. When we got there, there was yellow tape and police, and Lisa told me that Joy and Lindsay was dead, that they'd been shot. And uh, I remember screaming. And then a few minutes later, I said, where's Emily? And she said, she's there too. And then I said, where's Ryan? And she said, he's in the ambulance over there. I said, is he hurt? And she said, no. And that was all the details I knew at that time. So what was your gut telling you? I just, I was, I was in shock. I didn't, I just couldn't think beyond that they were gone and I just couldn't believe it. You know, what, what could have happened? And why did it happen? That was exactly what investigators wanted to find out. Did the champions have any known enemies? None. I never could find anybody to ever say a bad thing about them, just good people. As members of the community rallied around Ryan, investigators determined that the alleged shooter, Vito Reservato, was a 22-year-old local. He had this ID on his person, and you'll notice he has got a very um, distinct birthmark on right. his face. And so they were able to identify him. Vito Reservato. Yes. Who, who, who was he? Can't really tell you a whole lot about Vito's background. I know he had a young child. Um, when this happened, friends and people who knew of Vito um, were shocked that he was engaged in this kind of behavior. Any criminal past? No criminal past. Investigators wondered, why would a young man with no record suddenly snap and kill an entire family? They also had a long list of questions for the one person who managed to escape the scene completely unharmed. Why is he not injured? Why does he not have any marks on him at all? How is that possible? Police have a long night ahead of them as they try to figure out what would possess someone to kill a mother, a father, and a daughter. It is very obvious that these people were loved in this community. Officers also found a fourth body. Police believe it belongs to the man who murdered the three champions. As investigators continue to process the brutal crime scene late into the night, they soon realized things were simply not adding up. Why would Vito kill the woman he supposedly was infatuated with? Ryan's story that Vito was obsessed with Emily just didn't make any sense to me. It turns out Lindsay Champion's sister Lisa had also been skeptical of her nephew's story from the moment he showed up at her front door. She especially had trouble believing that the alleged killer, Vito Reservato, had become instantly obsessed with her niece. Emily is a little bit too much like me. She's not somebody that you would warm up to quickly. Um, she was a wonderful young lady, but I just, I thought, I can't believe that somebody falls head over heels in love with her automatically and is just infatuated with her, so infatuated that they resort to doing something as drastic as what he did. And I thought, this just doesn't make sense. So why was Vito at the house that day? Police needed to investigate further. As they continued speaking to the survivor, they were eager to learn more about the relationship between Vito and Emily. As it turned out, Vito had recently worked for Ryan. Ryan did odd jobs. He did construction work and remodel bathrooms and stuff like that. So he said he had hired Vito because Vito was down on his luck, needed some money, and uh, he was going to hire Vito to help him work. According to Ryan's initial story, he met Vito just days earlier on Thursday, October 23rd. He brought Vito over to his parents' home to help gather some tools, and it was then that Vito first met Emily Champion. Ryan said while they were there, Emily was there too, and Vito became fixated on Emily. So much so that Ryan was scared for Emily. Ryan told detectives 
that Vito began making inappropriate comments about Emily, comments that made him feel so uncomfortable that he ended their short-lived partnership that very same day. And while investigators tried to corroborate this story, Ryan was talking to the media. Is that Pat okay the way The day after the shootings, Ryan appeared on the local news. I mean, this has been a horrific 24 hours. How are, are you personally holding up? You seem remarkably composed. To be honest, I really don't know yet, really, how to feel about any of it. It was just, it was, it was horrible. I mean, none of us expected to see him back at the scene. And I thought, he's bound to be in shock. He's bound to be devastated. We probably won't see him for a few days. But he was right back at the site on TV, telling everybody his version of what happened. It was odd. My parents were unbelievably good people. Unbelievably good people. Over the next few days, Ryan would continue telling his story to the press. Meanwhile, detectives spoke with Vito Reservato's roommates, and they revealed some startling new information. What did Vito's roommates tell you? Vito's roommates said that Vito had been down on his luck for money, and all of a sudden they said one day he seemed happy. And they said, you know, what's gotten into you? And they said, somebody's hired me. I've got a job to do. You know, my baby will be taken care of, and I'll be taken care of. According to Vito's roommates, this mysterious new job was going to pay Vito $30,000. So we dug in further, and he had told his roommates that a boy named Ryan had hired him to kill three people. Did Vito's roommates take his story seriously? Um, not really. Not really. They thought he was just full of it and just talking out of his head, really. If the roommate's story was true, it could help explain why Ryan was uninjured on that fateful day. But could Lindsay and Joy Champion's only son really have wanted his loving family killed? And if so, why? To get to the bottom of it all, Sergeant Miller brought Ryan back to the scene of the crime. We had about a two and a half hour reenactment that we did at the scene. We called Ryan out there and there was nothing believable that he said that matched logic. Ryan's contention was that he had to fight Vito for the handgun after Vito had shot the mother, the father, and Emily. And he was so unbelievable, he said that when Vito ran past him to shoot Emily, Vito looked at Ryan and said, excuse me. He said, excuse me. He said, excuse me. And I, and I just don't, that is just unbelievable. It didn't happen. The investigation did show that they were romantically involved. And it was apparent that she actively participated in the planning of these murders. After receiving an influx of alarming information, detectives were taking a closer look at Ryan Champion. So three days after the murders, they had him reenact the crime the way he claimed it had gone down. Ryan's contention was that he had to fight Vito for the handgun after Vito had shot the mother, the father, and Emily. He said that's when he came to me and put the gun in my face and realized that the gun had run dry. And he dropped the empty mag and put a new magazine in the gun, uh, racked the slide forward, and that's when Ryan made his move. But there was a hole in his story that Ryan couldn't answer. The gun used in the murders had a magazine that held only seven bullets. Four bullets had been spent shooting at Lindsay, two at Joy, then another four at Emily, for a total of 10 bullets. Simple math was a big problem for Ryan because the magazine only held seven rounds, so Vito was not reloading when he took the gun from him. And so I told him that, and he said, that's not possible. And I said, Ryan, it's simple math. And he said, I don't know what to say to that. And I said, I, I bet you don't. After Ryan's reenactment, 
police brought him to the station for more questioning. We sat there and talked for, a, it seemed like a three hour interview. It was an interview that turned into an interrogation. And we had a couple words and he just looked at me and he said, I didn't kill my family. And I said, Ryan, it's not a question at this point. I know you killed your family and we're gonna prove you killed your family. But in order to arrest Ryan, Kentucky State Police needed additional evidence to prove that his son would kill his entire family without a clear motive. So detectives dug deeper, turning their attention to the duct tape that was used to bind the victims. Well, Ryan contended in every interview that he was taped up first because he was the biggest threat to Vito. And so we thought, well, Maybe, maybe we can look at the duct tape and show that Ryan was not taped first. He was taped last. It was a shot in the dark. This is the tape that we found on the floor at the crime scene. And this is the end of the tear that was on Ryan Champion. And if you look at it, you can see how it perfectly fits in there. That matches a perfect tear. And that's significant because? It shows that the last piece of tape torn from this roll was used to tape Ryan. This refutes his story completely that he was taped up first. These discarded strands of tape were suddenly proof positive that Ryan had lied about the sequence of events. But did that make Ryan the killer? While investigators were quickly to figure that out, Ryan remained a free man. So did you see Ryan again after mm -hmm. this? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When we went over to the house to pick out clothes for the funeral. Did you have any substantive conversation with him about the not, circumstances no, surrounding murders? Not, not a lot, murders? not no. a lot, because we were just kind of biding our time. The police just said, you know, that they were doing their investigation and, you know, we didn't want to alienate him right away in case he slipped up on saying something. Your gut is telling you, my nephew killed my family, and you're around him? I can't it was imagine hard. How, how hard that would be. It was, it was. To look at him and think, you know, you did this. You know, and part of me just couldn't, my head knew it, but my heart just couldn't accept it, that someone we loved and raised could do that. Did you fear for your safety? In the days after? Sure. Before that, I was not a person that carried a, a weapon. Needless to say, uh, things changed. On October 31st, five days after the murders, the Champion family gathered to make funeral arrangements for Lindsay, Joy, and Emily. We had to go to the funeral home. And um, it was discussed with the funeral home director. We were concerned about the safety of everybody, because he was still on the loose. You know, if he would murder Joy, Lindsay, and Emily, and Vito, who's next? What else would he do? Police weren't going to wait to find out. The duct tape was enough to put it over the edge to get probable cause for the arrest. And so we see him, and we tell him he's under arrest, and he acted shocked, and he went away with us. He was charged with the murder of Emily Champion, Lindsay Champion, Joy Champion, and Vito Reservato. He was also charged with um, kidnapping, and that applied to his sister, Emily Champion, because she was bound heavily with duct tape. What was your reaction when you learned that Ryan was finally arrested? It was inappropriate behavior for in a funeral home but I'm in the back of the parlor and I'm trying to get everybody's attention and I'm saying, they got him, they got him, they got him. And it was like a, it was like a charismatic church service is what I felt like, <laughs> you know, because everybody's rejoicing. Thank God. Thank God. Not only is he being arrested for what he's done, but we're not gonna have to deal with him. We can grieve without him being there and pretending that he cared. With Ryan behind bars awaiting trial, the champions were at last able to lay their loved ones to rest. But the case was far from over. Police still wondered what possible motive Ryan could have had to kill his family, and why did his would-be accomplice, Vito Reservato, end up dead beside them? 
video evidence from a local Waffle House was about to provide some startling answers. Ryan Champion had just been arrested and charged for the murders of his mother, father, sister, and his one-time employee, Vito Reservato. But investigators still didn't understand what role 22-year-old Vito played in the murders until an unexpected tip came in from a few towns over. We got a phone call from a gentleman that uh, frequents the Waffle House in the neighboring town of Oak Grove. And this gentleman said that he knew the Champion family, and he thought that he saw Ryan and Vito and some woman that he didn't know who she was at the Waffle House a few days before the murders happened, eating together. So we thought, let's go check it out. There, on the Waffle House security video, were Ryan and Vito. Here they come right here. This was five days. Five, five days murder. before. Yes, sir. At this time, Ryan Champion was only claiming to have known Vito Reservato since Thursday, and the murders happened on uh, on a Sunday. So obviously, he had known Vito longer than what he indicated to the police. And police were also surprised that they were joined at the restaurant by a third person who they would come to identify as Ann Plotkin. How did you learn about Ann Plotkin? The day that Ryan was interviewed first, which is the day that the murders occurred, he threw out Ann Plotkin's name to basically solidify his story that Vito was obsessed with Emily. And he said that we need to go talk to Ann because Ann will tell you the same thing. Ann knows Vito because Vito dated Ann's daughter. So Ann will have information if you go talk to her. So that's what we did. Tell me a little bit about Ann Plotkin. Um, Ann Plotkin and Ryan Champion had known each other for years. She was a um, advocate for Ryan Champion in the days following the murders. I don't understand it. I really don't because I know Ryan and know There is no way. I'm going to be there for Ryan no matter what. When investigators questioned Ann, they learned there was a reason that she stood by him. They were romantically involved? The investigation did show that they were romantically involved. What did Ann Plotkin say about Ryan? She called him her ride and die partner. But what was Ann doing at the Waffle House with Ryan and Vito? And could she have possibly have had a hand in their deadly scheme? Eager to learn more, investigators pressed Ann for information. We wanted to talk to her specifically about her phone. We wanted to know if there were messages between Vito and her and Ryan on her phone. And she said, no, there's not. And she picks up her phone, and she's just as quick as she can, she's just tapping it, just tapping her phone. And I stood up and got over behind her and said, what are you, are you deleting stuff? Because if she's deleting stuff, we've got to take her phone to preserve the evidence. Ann's attempt at deception had just unwittingly turned her from a witness into a suspect. Investigators promptly secured search warrants for phone records and Facebook accounts. We were able to get Facebook records from Ryan Champion's account, Vito Reservato's account, and Ann Plotkin's account. We were also able to get um, call logs from phone companies of each individual. What did the social media posts and, and communications reveal? It painted a very clear picture that Ann was the middle person the go-between for Ryan and Vito. If Vito needed to tell Ryan something, they never would directly call or text or Facebook one another. Anytime they needed to contact one another, they would go through Ann. And it was apparent once those were received that Ann Plotkin actively participated in the planning of these murders. In early February 2015, investigators secured a warrant for Ann Plotkin's arrest. We showed up at her apartment complex and told her she was under arrest, and she said she wasn't. She wasn't? She said she wasn't, and uh, she still went to jail, of course. And um, she denied everything. Anne was charged with complicity to commit capital murder and would now be joining her boyfriend, Ryan, behind bars. 
But what was Anne's motive for helping Ryan commit these murders? She kept saying, I had something to do with it. I helped. I kept his secrets. She knew what he was going to do. But she loved him, and she wanted to be with him. And I think Ryan was playing her, really, using her. As for Vita Reservado, the man who was both accomplice and victim, his motive, too, was plain to see. Vito had bills to pay and a family to take care of. Do you believe that Vito may have carried out the murders and then Ryan turned the tables on him and actually killed him? I don't because the shots were all headshots. Is right. that significant? Vito had no gun, gun experience. We talked to several people, friends and family. They never seen him shoot a gun. They all said he was scared to death of guns. But Ron was in the military. Was Vito the fall guy? Investigators thought so. So what do you think happened that day? I think Ryan killed everybody. I think Ryan killed his mom, his dad, his sister, and then he killed Vito to make sure that there weren't any witnesses. Ryan's motive was the last piece of the puzzle yet to fall into place. But investigators were inching closer to the truth. You also heard from Ryan's former girlfriend. I did. What did she say? She said any time his parents were mentioned, he would get fighting mad. He'd just face it, get red, and he'd start cussing, start shaking. She said that he hated his family. She thought it's because he felt belittled because I, I guess you know, Emily was a very successful equine veterinarian. But then you have Ryan, who really couldn't hold a job. And I think he felt less than appreciated by his family for that. Was there any evidence uh, that Ryan was mistreated by his parents? None at all. No, no evidence of that at all. Investigators were confident that they had built an airtight case against Ryan Champion for the murders of his family and Vito Reservado. And after speaking with Ryan's family, they learned of a deeply rooted animosity, which may have been behind his actions. What is behind this hatred? Ryan Champion was jealous of his sister, Emily Champion. The champions treated Ryan exactly like they treated Emily from everything that I was ever told. But Ryan, for some reason, believed that they favored Emily. Why would Ryan be jealous of his own sister? Because she was successful. She had a good job, loving what she was doing. Huh? And he felt like he had nothing. Did he believe that Lindsay and Joy loved Emily more than him? I don't, I don't know what he thought. They didn't. They loved them both. But it wasn't just hate that led Ryan to kill his family. He may have also been motivated by greed. Some members of the Champion family believe that Ryan wanted his parents' estate for himself. He wanted to inherit everything that, you know, he would have easy straight for a while. He'd have a house and some land and a little money, and, you know, he would, wouldn't have to work. And there was an incident just days before the murders that may have finally pushed Ryan's long simmering hatred for his family over the edge. The champions were going to do an addition on their property. Ryan wanted to do that addition because he, he did do carpentry work. Lindsay and Joy did not hire Ryan to Absolutely do this. Absolutely not. Why? That was way beyond his capabilities. Did that anger Ryan? I'm sure it did. In December 2016, two years after Ryan Champion was charged with murdering his family, Prosecutor Kerry Ovi Wiggins was preparing for trial. So we're going to seek the death penalty. Correct. The short of trial, we were able to reach an agreement for the penalty of life without parole for Ryan Champion. He ultimately pled guilty to all the counts that he was charged with. What was the tipping point? You know, I can't tell you what moved him to accept the deal. I think he knew he was going to get convicted. Are you satisfied with Ryan's sentence? 
Not really, because he needed to feel the same thing that Lindsay Joy and Emily felt, if there was any way that that could happen. In May of 2017, Ann Plotkin pleaded guilty to her role in the Champion family murders and was sentenced to 22 years in prison. Just two years later, Ann was being considered for compassionate early release due to a terminal illness. The parole board did hold a hearing and denied that early parole. Um, the next day, Ann Plotkin died in prison. In the wake of the murders, Vito Reservato's family and friends struggled to accept his involvement. They just did not believe how he could be involved in something such as that. And, and I can understand because they didn't have all the details. Had they had all the details, they would probably think, what in the world possessed this guy to go along with this fool in this scheme? And as for Ryan, despite accepting the plea, he has never admitted to the slayings or express remorse. I have a hard time even referring to Ryan by his name. So he's been evil for the past four years. You call Ryan evil? Yes. What would you call somebody that murdered your family? And I just feel like that the devil just crawled up in his body and just took control of him. He's just pure, pure evil. The cemetery is right up here on the right. Have you been there? No. Did you want to circle through? Sure. For the surviving family members, the unimaginable loss of Lindsay, Joy, and Emily Champion is something they continue to struggle with each and every day. How often do you visit? Several times a week, and I usually come at night so that people don't see me because I, I just like to be alone. What do you say when you're here? I just say that I'm sorry and uh, justice will be done. You have a 10 month old. Great granddaughter. Great granddaughter. When she's old enough to understand, how will you explain? There's evil in this world. That man is given free will even to commit evil. And of course, we talk about joy all the time, or Lindsay and Emily. So she'll grow up knowing about them. And she looks like joy, so. She does? Yeah. So you have that reminder mm -hmm. of your sister? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry you're still in so much pain. I'm sorry you're still oh, in so much ever, pain. It gets better a little bit, but it will never be over. Ever. For more information on Killer Motive, go to Oxygen.com.